Volume One, Chapter Seven, Part Two of A Popular History of England from the Earliest Times to the Reign of Queen Victoria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of England from the Earliest Times to the Reign of Queen Victoria by Francois Pierre Guillain Guizot. Chapter Seven, Part Two. Under the effects of so many violent emotions, the Archbishop had been taken ill. He sincerely believed himself to be bound to maintain the juridical rights of the Church, and in his mind this cause was absolutely identified with the cause of God. To allow the ecclesiastical privileges to be trammelled by the royal authority appeared to him an act of treason against the Lord God, who had elevated him unworthy as he was, to the office of pastor of souls. Defeated and troubled, he at one time thought of throwing himself at the king's feet and begging him to spare the church for the sake of their old friendship. But Becket's was a proud and ungovernable spirit, and such humiliation appeared impossible to him. He therefore resolved to fight it out to the last. It was on the 18th of October, 1164, that he was to appear before the court to receive his final sentence. Clad in his episcopal robes, he celebrated Mass in honour of St. Stephen, the first martyr, and then, after laying down his mitre, he advanced, holding a crucifix in his hand and followed by the priests into the council chamber. As he was entering, the Bishop of Hereford came to him with the intention of taking the crucifix from him. "'Allow me to keep it, my lord,' he said. "'It is the banner of the prince whom I serve.' The Bishop of London, Gilbert Folio, was there, and also wished to take the crucifix from the hands of the prelate. "'You defy the king,' cried he, "'by coming in this garb to his court. "'But the king holds a sword, "'the point of which is sharper than your crucifix.' The archbishop had, however, entered the council chamber, and on seeing him Henry blushed deeply and hastily retired. The archbishop sat down, but the bishops had been called away by the king. Discord reigned in the royal chamber. Henry was furious, and railed bitterly, first against the obstinacy of the archbishop, and then against the cowardice of his own advisers. The archbishop of York retired, calling all his followers, in order, as he said, to avoid seeing bloodshed. The Bishop of Exeter went and threw himself at Becket's feet, imploring him to give in and to save his life. Go, said the Archbishop, you do not understand those things which are of God. At length the bishops returned with Hilary of Chichester at their head. You were our primate, he said, but in putting yourself in opposition to the royal will, you have broken your oath of allegiance. A perjured Archbishop has no longer any claim upon our obedience. We will submit the affair to the Pope, and call upon you to answer before him for your conduct. I understand, replied the Archbishop coldly. The nobleman had followed the bishops, and the Earl of Leicester approached Becket. Hear your sentence, he began. My sentence, cried Becket. My son, listen to me first. You know how faithfully I have served the king, and with what repugnance I accepted this duty to please him. You are my children in God. Can a son sit in judgment on his father? I take exception to your tribunal and appeal to the Pope. I place myself, as well as my church, under his protection, and summon the bishops who have obeyed the king, rather than their God, to answer at that tribunal. It is under the protection of the Holy Catholic Church and of the Apostolic See, that I leave this court. He had risen from his seat, and all the bishops had done likewise. Followed by his priests, he strode slowly across the room. The courtiers insulted him and threw at him the bundles of straw which covered the floor. Somebody called out, Traitor! Were it not for the garments which I wear, that coward would repent his insolence, said the archbishop, who then mounted his horse, while he was saluted by the cries of the people who were prostrating themselves and asking his benediction. 
the prelate caused the doors of the monastery in which he resided to be opened and the poor entered in crowds the archbishop giving them a supper and sitting down to table with them himself the scriptures were being read and becket was struck by these words of the lord if you are persecuted in one town fly to another he sent to the king for a passport you shall be answered to-morrow was the message sent back from the palace the friends of becket were in great fear this night will be your last if you do not fly said the clergy the archbishop at length decided to leave england mounted on horseback and accompanied by three priests he set out in the direction of kent amidst torrents of rain that compelled him to cut off the skirts of his long mantle which were wet and heavy and were irksome to him he wandered about in the disguise of a monk and under the name of brother christian during twenty days in kent meeting with many adventures at length he procured a little vessel and landed on the second of november eleven sixty four in the countship of boulogne near Gravelin, whence he repaired on foot and in the same disguise to the convent of saint bertin near namur the fugitive's first thought was to ask shelter of the king of france and protection of pope alexander the second who was then residing at sens the anti-pope victor held possession of rome the ambassadors of henry the second had preceded becket at both courts but louis the young an enemy to the king of england and therefore unwilling to do the latter a service haughtily declared that it was the ancient privilege of the french crown to succour the oppressed against their persecutors the pope at first received becket's representative rather coldly but he ended by deciding to brave the anger of henry the second and received the fallen archbishop with great kindness if i had been willing to do the bidding of the king in all things said becket nobody in his kingdom would now be as great as i but i know that i obtain through him the position which i occupy to the prejudice of the liberty of the church that is the reason that i throw myself at your holiness's feet your holiness must appoint a new primate of england the pope did not accept this resignation and having caused the constitutions of clarendon to be read to the prelate he condemned them with the exception of six clauses then raising the archbishop whom he had reinvested with his ecclesiastical dignity go said he and learn in poverty to console the poor the pope assigned the abbey of pontigny to him as his residence and authorized him to excommunicate the enemies of the church when henry heard of the success of his adversary his anger knew no bounds not only did he confiscate both the goods and revenues of becket and the priests who had followed him but he included in his revenge all the members of the archbishop's family as well as all his friends he proscribed more than four hundred persons men women and children whom he sent divested of everything to becket to complain of the misfortune which he had brought upon them every day these unhappy people would present themselves at the convent of pontigny breaking the heart of the archbishop who found no rest until the time when the combined charity of king louis the pope and the queen of sicily provided for the necessities of the exiles meanwhile king henry had on hand grave affairs which would soon have made him forget his grievances against the archbishop if he had been of a less vindictive disposition the welsh had revolted and the war against them had been unfortunate in consequence of bad weather the king had consoled himself for this by causing the noses of the hostages to be cut off and their eyes destroyed but this was not sufficient to appease his anger he found satisfaction in brittany where he profited by the rebellion against conan henry took advantage of it to seize upon the country he celebrated in eleven sixty six the marriage of his son geoffrey with constance brittany was pacified but becket had just excommunicated all those who held the property of the church and particularly several of the king's favourites whom he mentioned by name when henry heard this news he was at chinon near tours his anger was so violent that he threw himself upon his bed 
tearing the clothes, biting the straw of the mattress, and howling with rage. He immediately informed the abbot of Pontigny that if the order of Cistercians wished to retain their property in the provinces dependent on the King of England, he must refuse the shelter of his house to the enemy who so haughtily defied his sovereign. The abbot went and saw Becket. "'God forbid that upon such injunctions the chapter should think of sending you away,' he said. "'Consider for yourself what you had better do.' The archbishop immediately made preparation to leave the place, and went to the convent of St. Columba near Sens, where King Louis had ordered that he should be received. 1168. Up to this period political considerations had created an ill feeling between the King of France and the King of England, and in this lay Becket's security. In 1169, similar influences brought them to an understanding. They met at a solemn conference at Montmorai, and when the young princes, Henry's sons, had done homage to the King of France for Normandy, Aquitaine and Brittany, the case of Becket was considered, and he was ordered to appear before the august assembly. The archbishop was growing weary of his exile, and his protectors were growing weary of defending him. It was therefore hoped that he would tender his submission, in order to end the struggle. Becket presented himself before King Henry with a grave and modest air. Bending his knee, the archbishop said, My liege, in all the disputes which have taken place between us, I submit to your judgment. As arbitrary sovereign in all points, except the honour of God. Immediately this restriction was uttered, the king burst into a passion, and turning towards King Louis, Do you know, he cried, what would happen, if I were to accept this reservation, everything that should displease him would be contrary to the honour of God, and I should lose all power. There have been archbishops at Canterbury much more pious than he, and there have been kings in England less powerful than I. Let him only treat me as the least pious of his predecessors treated the smallest of mine, and I shall be satisfied. Save the honour of God, repeated the archbishop. The assembly cried out aloud that it was past endurance, that the king could ask no less, and that Becket was too exacting. "'Do you wish, then, to be more than a saint?' asked Louis angrily. But he got no further concession, and the two kings remounted their horses without taking leave of the archbishop, whose fate was now very much harder by reason over the estrangement of the king of France. He was reduced to live by arms, until the day when Louis again sent for him. It is to banish us from his dominions, the clergy said in alarm, but scarcely had the king seen the archbishop when he threw himself in his arms. Forgive me, father, he cried. You are right, we were mistaken. We wish to subject the honour of God to the will of a man. Absolve me. Henry had failed to fulfil his contracts with King Louis, who had thereupon hastened to express his approval of Becket's conduct. A fresh attempt at a reconciliation broke down in consequence of the king's firm decision never to give to the archbishop the kiss of peace, with which it was usual to ratify all oaths. Meanwhile, Prince Henry had been crowned in England, his father wishing to secure the succession to him. Becket's office had been usurped, the young prince having received the crown from the hands of the Archbishop of York. The Pope had returned to Rome after the death of the Antipope Victor, and the displeasure or favour of the King of England now had fewer attractions or horrors for him. Henry was afraid that he might authorise Becket to excommunicate him personally, and to place his kingdom under an interdict, and he at length yielded, under the advice of the King of France, with whom he had just effected a reconciliation. In the month of July, 1170, the two antagonists met within the confines of Touraine. As soon as the king perceived the archbishop, he came forward, helmet in hand, and accosted him. They conversed in a friendly manner, with a certain amount of their old familiarity, and when they parted from each other, the king said to his courtiers, I found the archbishop most favourably disposed towards me, and if the feeling were not mutual, I should be the worst of men. Within two days of this event, 
reconciliation took place. Becket bent his knee to the king, who held the stirrup for the archbishop to remount his horse. But the kiss of peace was not given. However, the restitution of the archbishop's property was agreed upon. Henry promised to supply Becket with the money requisite to defray his travelling expenses to England, and the two enemies, apparently reconciled, took leave of each other. "'I do not believe that I shall ever see you again,' said the archbishop, looking fixedly at the king. "'What? Do you take me for a traitor?' cried Henry angrily. The prelate only bowed in answer. He never saw the king again. The archbishop had proceeded to Rouen, awaiting the money which had been promised to him, and during the sojourn which he was compelled to make in Normandy, he received frequent warnings of the dangers which awaited him on the other side of the channel. They will not even allow Becket time enough to eat a whole loaf, said Ranoff de Brock, who had been excommunicated by him. But Becket did not take heed of any warnings. Even, he said, if I had to face the certainty of being cut to pieces on the other side of the channel, I should not turn back on my way. Seven years of absence are sufficient for the pastor and for his flock. After having waited for four months, he borrowed three hundred livres of the Archbishop of Rouen, and set sail in a small vessel which landed him in Sandwich Bay, whereby he avoided an ambush which had been prepared for him near Dover. A messenger preceded the prelate, bearing letters of excommunication from the Pope against the Archbishop of York, the Bishop of London, and the Bishop of Chichester, who had all taken part in the ceremony of the coronation of the young king. The letters were publicly consigned to the three bishops, who were enraged beyond measure. It was on the 1st of December that Becket returned to England, to the great delight of the people, but not a single baron came to meet him. The first who passed were armed and drew their swords. One of the king's chaplains, who had accompanied the primate, was at great pains to quiet them, and to protect Becket on his re-entering his episcopal city. "'He gathers serfs round him on his way,' said the nobleman, "'and leads them with him. "'The archbishop had come back to Canterbury "'after having attempted to obtain an interview with the young king, "'his old pupil. "'But the latter had refused to see him, "'and Becket, confined his diocese, "'surrounded himself with the poor and the peasants.' who constituted a rustic guard round him. Excommunications were still being proclaimed. On Christmas Day, after having begun his sermon with these words, Venio ad vos, more inter vos, I come to you to die among you, Becket, reminding his congregation that one of their archbishops had suffered martyrdom, added, You will, perhaps, see another suffer in the same manner, but, before dying, I will avenge some of the wrongs done to the church. He then excommunicated Renalf and Robert de Brock, his bitter enemies. Meanwhile, the suspended bishops had crossed the sea to go and lay their complaints before King Henry the Second, who was still in Normandy. We throw ourselves at your mercy in the name of the church and state, for your peace and ours. There is a man who is inflaming all England. He marches with troops of armed horsemen and foot soldiers, prowling around the fortresses, trying to effect an entrance. Henry had never sincerely forgiven his old favourite, and he was very angry at these accounts of his conduct. What? cried he. Does this wretch who has eaten my bread, who came to my court a beggar, upon a lame horse, with all he possessed behind him, insult me with impunity, while not one of the cowards whom I feed at my table dares to deliver me from a priest who is so obnoxious to me. Words like these are always caught up by willing ears. When the king convoked a council of his barons to decide what was to be done with Becket, four of their number were absent. Richard Brito, Hugh de Morville, William de Tracy, and Reginald Fitzurse. When the king observed that they were not there, he became uneasy, and hastened the departure of the Earl of Montville, who was commissioned to arrest Becket. 
the four conspirators preceded him. On the 29th of December, in the morning, they arrived at Canterbury, followed by a troop of soldiers whom they had collected together on their way. They wished to secure the help of the mayor of the town, but the latter refused. The knights recommended him at least to keep the townsmen quiet, and they proceeded to the prelate's house with twelve of their friends. The archbishop was in his room, and the knights sat down on the floor without saluting him and in silence. No one dared begin. The archbishop asked their business. "'We have come on behalf of the king,' said Reginald Fitzurse, "'in order that those you have excommunicated may be absolved, "'that the bishops who have been suspended "'may be re-established in their positions, "'and that you may justify your designs against the king.' "'It is not I who excommunicated the Archbishop of York,' said Becket, "'but the Pope himself. "'As to the others, I will re-establish them "'if they will tender their submission.' "'From whom do you hold your appointment as Archbishop?' inquired Fitzurse. "'From the Pope or from the King?' "'My spiritual office I hold by the will of God and the Pope,' said the Primate, "'and my temporal rights from the King. "'It is not from the King, then, that you obtain everything?' No. The knights were restless and were twisting their gloves angrily. I am astonished, said Becket, that men who formerly swore allegiance to me come into my house to threaten me. We will do more than threaten, cried the barons. They thereupon retired hastily. The priests and attendants who surrounded Becket were alarmed. They wanted to close all the doors and barricade the house, begging the bishop to take refuge in the church. He refused. Already the noise of battle-axes rattling against the entrance was heard. Fitzurse was endeavouring to break open the door, which an attendant had shut upon the intruders, who had now come back with their weapons. The bell of the church was ringing for vespers. "'Since it is my duty, I will go to the church,' said Becket, and preceded by a priest carrying a cross, he passed slowly through the cloisters and entered the cathedral." The door had not given way, but the conspirators had just entered the palace by the window. The clergy were hastening to close the doors of the church. No, said the archbishop, the house of God should not be barricaded like a fortress. He was ascending the steps, leading to the choir, when Reginald Fitzurse entered abruptly at the other end of the church. He was brandishing his sword and crying, Come, loyal subjects of the king! It was late. The movements of the conspirators were scarcely observable. Neither could the latter see the priest distinctly. The archbishop was urged to descend into the crypt. He refused, and advanced boldly towards the sacrilegious intruders, who were brandishing their swords within the holy precincts. His cross-bearer alone had not fled. "'Where is the traitor?' cried a voice. Becket did not answer. "'Where is the Archbishop?' repeated Fitzurse. "'I am here,' said Becket. "'But no traitor, only a priest of the Lord. "'What are you here for? "'Absolve all those whom you have excommunicated. "'They have not repented, and therefore I cannot. "'You shall die, then. "'I am ready, in the name of the Saviour, "'but I forbid you, by the Lord Almighty, "'to touch any of these present.' either priests or laymen. At this moment he received between the shoulders a blow with the flat part of the sword. Fly, they cried, or you are a dead man. The archbishop did not stir. The intruders endeavoured to drag him out, not daring to kill him in the sanctuary. He was struggling in their grasp. At length William de Tracy raised his sword and wounded the archbishop in the head, striking down at the same time the hand of Edward Grime, the brave cross-bearer. Becket had clasped his hands together. I confide my soul and the cause of the church to God, to the Virgin Mary, to the patron saints of this church, and to St. Denis, he cried. A second thrust from a sword laid him prostrate upon the ground near St. Bennet's altar. A third blow split his skull, and the sword was broken on the paved floor. Thus perish all traitors, 
cried one of the conspirators, and they left the church hurriedly, while the monks were tearfully laying the archbishop's body out at the foot of the altar, taking up his blood in vessels, leaving exposed to view the hair cloth which he wore, and already revering him as a martyr. But on the morrow they were obliged to bury him in great haste, in order to spare his dead body the indignity of being insulted by Ranulf de Brock, who desired to take it away. The Archbishop of York publicly declared that Becket had fallen in his guilt and his pride like Pharaoh, while other bishops maintained that the body of the traitor ought not to lie in consecrated ground, and that he should be thrown into the foulest ditch, or be put upon a gibbet to rot. It was forbidden in the churches to speak of him as a martyr. Decrees are incapable of influencing the development of public opinion. King Henry was the first to discover this. Scarcely had he heard the news, when a profound feeling of repentance for his imprudent words overcame him. He shut himself up in his private apartment, and during three days would not see anybody or take any food. When he awoke from this sullen depression, he immediately sent an ambassador to the Pope, assuring the latter of his innocence and of the grief which the death of the Archbishop caused him. At the same time, he hesitated to punish the murderers, who had acted according to his suggestion, and he allowed them the benefit of clergy, the crime having been committed upon the person of a priest. Thus the liberties of the church, for which Becket had just died, protected his assassins. It is related that the latter were stricken with remorse in their turn, and that they went and threw themselves at the feet of the Pope at Rome, who ordered them to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, where they died sincerely penitent. If the story of the repentance of the murderers is not well authenticated, that of Becket's posthumous triumph is incontestable. He had not been buried two years, and King Henry had scarcely obtained forgiveness of the Pope, 1172, by undertaking to support, during three years, two hundred horsemen, intended for the defence of the Holy Sepulchre, when pilgrims were already proceeding in crowds to Canterbury Cathedral, begging the protection of the martyr, canonised by the public voice, before being recognised as a saint by the Church. Two more years elapsed, and on the 10th of July, 1174, the King was proceeding barefooted along the road leading to Canterbury. Each step he made left behind him a spot of blood. He wore a pilgrim's dress, and on his arrival descended into the crypt and prostrated himself before the tomb. The Bishop of London from the pulpit assured the people of the innocence of the King of the profound grief which the death of the Archbishop had caused him, and of the remorse which he experienced for the fit of anger which had caused the commission of the crime. The king remained praying. He rose, uncovered his shoulders, and, passing before the chapter, he received from each monk three strokes from a knotted rope. Henry then returned to the tomb, still fasting and praying. He passed the night in the church, and in the morning after, having attended Holy Mass, he returned to London, so exhausted by the fatigue and severity of his punishment, that he fell ill on his arrival. End of chapter 7 Reading by Florence